Welcome to Our Lady of Lourdes Parish in Massapequa Park, New York. I'm Monsignor Jim Lasanti. Delighted to have you joining us as we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, the Lord be with you. With your spirit. To better celebrate this Mass, let's take a moment, a moment of peaceful silence, to look into our consciences and to confess our sins. For those times we fail to love as we should, especially within our own families, Lord, have mercy. For the times we fail to live our faith courageously, announcing that we belong to Jesus Christ, Christ, have mercy. For the good we mean to do and intend to do but don't do, for all the sins that we embrace by not doing the right thing, the sins of omission, Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us all to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory, Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father. Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And let us pray. Let us pray that God will increase our faith and bring to perfection the many gifts he's given to us. Almighty God, every good thing comes from you. Fill our hearts with love for you, increase our faith, and by your constant care, protect all the good that you've given us. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. You duped me, O Lord, and I let myself be duped. You were too strong for me, and you triumphed. All the day, I am an object of laughter. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I must cry out. Violence and outrage is my message. The word of the Lord has brought me derision and reproach all the day. I say to myself, I will not mention him. I will speak in his name no more. But then it becomes like fire burning in my heart, imprisoned in my bones. I grow weary holding it in. I cannot endure it. The word of the Lord. Thanks. The response is, my soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. My soul is thirsting for you. O oh God, you are my God whom I seek. For you, my flesh pines and my soul thirst, like the earth, parched, lifeless, and without water. My soul is thirsting for you, O oh Lord my God. Thus have I gazed toward you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. For your kindness is a greater good than life. My lips shall glorify you. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. First will I bless you while I live. Lifting up my hands, I will call upon your name. As with the riches of a banquet shall my soul be satisfied. And with exultant lips, my mouth shall praise you. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. You are my help, and in the shadow of your wings, I shout for joy. My soul clings fast to you. Your right hand upholds me. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. 
I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to the Lord, your spiritual worship. Do not conform yourselves to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. The word of the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. May the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ, enlighten the eyes of our hearts that we may know what is the hope that belongs to our call. Alleluia, alleluia. alleluia. Lord, be in my heart and on my lips that I might worthily proclaim your gospel through the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer greatly from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed on the third day, be raised. Then Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid, Lord, no such thing shall ever happen to you. And he turned and he said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an obstacle to me. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. And then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit would there be for one to gain the whole world, but to forfeit his life? Or what can one give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in his Father's glory, and then he will repay all according to his conduct. And this is the Gospel of our Lord. Thank you for being with us to pray this 22nd Sunday in Ordinary Time. Let's take a look at these great readings, and we'll start with the prophet Jeremiah. One of the things that's been noted in recent times is the diminishment of people who are affiliated with any particular religion. Uh, More than any time in the past hundred years, we have fewer people uh, than ever expected who say, no, I'm not anything. And then you have an even stronger growth of people who are calling themselves agnostic, the I'm not sure people, if there's a God, or a very strong growth, thanks to a number of popular books in atheism. I don't believe in anything. Uh, Everything is just uh, accidental. So you've got a growth in in atheism, a growth in agnosticism, a growth in the unaffiliated. Uh, And to me, in some ways, it makes sense. Why would it make sense? Because in my mind, that may be the easy way out. You know what Jeremiah talks about here is that having faith, if you really live it, is going to cost you. Having faith means that you're committed to a set of principles, a set of beliefs, and in our case, a person, Jesus of Nazareth, that is quite specific. See, if I'm holding him up as my model, as the person I follow, I embrace, I emulate, that's a high bar, bar to follow. I've got I've to step over a bar that calls on Jesus himself as my model, and that's a tough model to follow. Whereas if I say I don't believe in anything, I think it's all circumstantial, nothing is godly, well, then I have no standard, do I? I have no particular thing that I have to live up to. And Jeremiah talks about that, too, in terms of belonging to God. Listen to what he says. He says, I try to be silent about my faith, and then, quote, then becomes like fire burning in my heart. If you have ever been through the experience of being in love, I mean really in love, where you finally said, oh, my God, this is the person meant for me. This is the person I always hoped and prayed God would send to my life. You know that it's highly unlikely that you're going to be passionately, wonderfully, deeply in love with someone and not want to tell the whole world. Because that's what love does. You're so delighted that out of the billions of people, all the possible losers you could have ended up with, you ended up with this winner of a person who you know is God's gift to you. And you want to tell the whole world. It's not unusual for people deeply in love to want to tell anyone and everyone, I'm so happy. I have found the love of my life. Well, now multiply that many times over. If you have found and you believe 
in the God who gives meaning to your life, how can you be silent? And that's just what Jeremiah is saying. He says, I couldn't be silent. I tried to be. I know that belonging to God is going to cost me. I'm going to have people who resist me, people who put me down, people who push against me. And I tried to be quiet, but I couldn't because when you have faith, it's a burning in your life that will not let you go. It's really what we talk about when we talk about the hound of heaven, that you feel God chasing you and you can't avoid that special connection, that love, that wonderful relationship, that friendship that you have with God himself. You know, I, uh, for many years, would give clergy conferences around the country to different groups of priests, Chicago and uh, uh, Wilmington, Delaware, and Los Angeles and uh, Atlanta, so many places I went that I was delighted to go and speak to the priests. And one of the things I found, especially in confession, would be that in times of frustration, priests would say, you know, there's certainly times when I've given thought to leaving the ministry when times were tough. But so in inevitably they will say to me, but there's something about this that I just love. There's something about this work, this ministry, this working for God that I, I don't want to put down. For all the problems and challenges and uh, and difficulties being a priest in this modern day society is, and presents to everyone who's in ministry, you just know that you belong to God and you love God and you're doing his work and you can't be silent. You can't put it on a shelf. That's what Jeremiah is talking about. True faith will not be sidelined. And hopefully you and I have that true faith and we will not be silent in telling the world, no, I'm not an agnostic. I'm not wondering if there's a God. And no, I'm certainly not an atheist. I know there's a God. And I want to tell the whole world how wonderful he is and the difference he's made in my life. Let's go now to the second reading, St. Paul to the Romans. The key line, it seems to me, is do not conform yourselves to this age. In other words, there's always a risk for all of us of embracing the ways of our culture so much that we forget that our true home is in heaven. We are not called on. We are simply not called on to fit in. And if we can say about our lives, I'm just like everybody else, that's a failure of our faith. Faith is going to require of us to be countercultural, to stand against the tide, to not be PC, to be politically correct. You know, and I, that political correctness is certainly making the world a crazy, crazy place. I just read this uh, piece in one of the major newspapers saying we can't refer anymore to the big bedroom in your house as the master bedroom because it refers back to those days when they had plantations and the master of the plantation. Come on, all the master bedroom means in my house is it's the biggest room of the three bedrooms, that's all. But this is the insanity of our age. You have to say certain things and not say other things and be highly sensitized. Whereas if you fit in too much and you're not able to say, well, I may not fit in, after all, I believe in the carpenter of Nazareth who died 2,000 years ago and gives meaning to my life and conquered death, and I believe in heaven, and I believe in faith, in eternal life. Those are certainly not things that will make us fit in easily to the popular culture. I believe that life is sacred. I think every single person created is made in the image and likeness of God. I believe every child from the moment of conception deserves protection. I believe we should call things what they are and not use the language of illusion. I'm pro-choice. When really what you're saying is I'm pro-abortion. Oh, no, no, I'm not really for abortion. Well, then you're not pro-choice because the choice is a choice for abortion. Why don't we call it like it is? Why don't we say who we are? Why don't we admit the truth? I belong to Jesus Christ and everything that comes with that. And if you don't like me because of that, that's okay. I'm not here to please you. I have an audience of one, my God. And when I stand before him, I want him to be able to say, did you ever shirk from embracing me in front of others? Did you ever deny me? Did you ever in any way run from me? And I hope you and I can say no. I didn't conform to this age uh, where we're always wondering, is there a God? Maybe not, maybe yes. Yes, there's a God. And his name is Jesus of Nazareth, and we are unapologetic about belonging to him. I love on this radio show that I host personally speaking when I, I have a Christian who will be on and is like totally unafraid of saying, I belong to Jesus Christ, he is the meaning of my life, and I'm delighted to belong to him. Because so many other guests will say, well, you know, I was raised Christian, I was raised Catholic, but you know, then I began to wonder and wander. Oh, isn't it great when you're one, run into people instead who just say, no apologies, this is who I am, I belong to Jesus, end of story. And that's what we're being warned of by St. Paul to the Romans. Do not conform yourself to this age. And this age is very ambiguous. Ambiguous. We don't want to talk about anything as being definite. Well, there is something definite. Life is sacred, life is a gift from God, and God himself came in the form of Jesus Christ, and he is Lord and Savior. 
Full stop, no apologies. That's what we're asked by St. Paul to do. And finally, let's go to the Gospel. The Gospel of Matthew is really more of the same. It talks about the fact that discipleship, if you live it rightly, is going to cost you. Look, Peter was probably not a terrible man, but he was getting to be a little bit into political correctness. Look, Lord, if we want to sell your message, we have to make it palatable. We have to make it something people can, can handle. You start talking about dying and suffering and, and going through all sorts of tough times for the faith, and, and I'm telling you, people are going to walk away from us. This is not the way to win a crowd. And you know what Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And he says to his disciples, look, if you follow me, it's going to cost you. It's not easy to be a Christian. It's not easy to stand against the tide. It's not easy to be politically incorrect. But that's what we're called on by God to do. And he had to put St. Peter in his place and tell him, look, you may not always fit in. You may find the tide of popular opinion turns against you. But you belong to me. And never be ashamed of saying that. I would hope that if you, in fact, have found the love of your life, you will never, ever say, well, I kind of love her, I kind of love him. But say, no, I love this person. They're imperfect like everyone else, but boy, they are truly the love of my life. Well, if you'll say that about someone you love, husband or wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, my God, I hope you'll say it too about your God. Without apology, this is who I am, this is who I love, this is the value system I embrace. And no, I won't call it a a big bedroom, I'll call it a master bedroom, and stop apologizing as we do in the name of political correctness. I belong to Jesus Christ, no apologies, no shame, no embarrassment. Can we live that way? It's hard to do. It's so much easier to fit in. Some years ago, we had up on Long Island a visit from Justice Antonin Scalia, Supreme Court Justice, passed away a couple of years ago, but we got talking about other justices on the Supreme Court, and there was one in particular, I won't name him because that's not important, but I said, Justice Scalia, I was told years ago that this judge was someone who believed in the sanctity of life and that he, in fact, would recognize that we've gone too far in this unrestricted right to abortion. Now, what happened to him that he starts to vote now the other way? And Justice Scalia said it's very, very tempting, especially when you live in Washington and there's a great social scene there, to want to be part of the elite, the Georgetown Society. He said, and maybe this justice got co-opted by that. He knows that if he stands with the unborn child, he's probably going to be vilified by the Washington Post and much of the elite. And that was too much for him. And so he changed his point of view. But I think Justice Scalia, by staying faithful to the sanctity of life, also recognized that Georgetown society will come and go, the, the elite will come and go, the Washington Post will come and go. But what is forever is the reality that we're going to face God and is going to ask us, Jim, Joan, Patty, John, Frank, did you know my truth? Yes, Lord, I did. Did you live it? I tried to. Did you embrace it publicly? Did you embrace me without shame or embarrassment? Yes, Lord, I try. Well then, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm hoping that's what you and I will face at the end of our lives. Finally, I want to talk about someone who, to me, reflects gospel values. Now, you all know, some of you have been so kind in writing me and calling me. This week, September 4th, is the 100th birthday of my mom, Cecilia. God willing, we'll celebrate it this coming Friday. And to me, she is, in so many ways, the embodiment of what I'm talking about here. I've been talking about faith and values and how to live it, but you don't get those from nowhere. You get them from other people, you know, people who live it, and by living it, teach us how wonderful it is to belong to Jesus Christ. Just a little background on my mom, born in Asbury Park, New Jersey, uh, September 4th uh, in 1920, um, the son of uh, Louise and Jim McNeil, uh, one of four children, an older brother James, uh, a younger brother Joseph, a younger sister Mary, raised in abject poverty during the Depression. They had absolutely nothing. And yet, when you talk about those times in which they couldn't pay the rent and barely had food on the table, you'll hear her say all the time, even now, we had nothing, but we didn't know we had nothing because we were rich in love, rich in love. And that's a message that she's passed on to us, that things are nice, good food is nice, having shelter is certainly important, but that the family that sustains love has the most important ingredient of all, of a successful and happy life. And she had that. And then she passed that very much on to me and to my sisters, Joan and Patty, and to the five grandchildren, now the three great-grandchildren. Uh, there are particular elements of her life I want to share with you that taught me the importance of gospel values. Just a couple of things, if I can share them with you. Um, one is 
the relationship she had with my dad. You know, we live in an age where the concept of lifelong faithfulness is kind of passe, kind of uh, cute, but gone. So she meets this guy when she's 17 years old, they're both 17, in Kelly Park in Brooklyn, playing handball. They fall in love, and they date for 10 years before they get married. And they're faithful to each other during those 10 years. He's gone for four years, serving as a Marine captain in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Four years, their only contact is the occasional letter. They don't see each other, but they stay faithful and true. The only man she ever loved, the only man she ever had any kind of relationship with till the day he died, 57 years later after their marriage, is my father. And she would point out to us when my grand her grandchildren would say, you know, is it possible that you could be faithful to one person your whole life? Absolutely, she'd tell them. That true love does that. It makes a choice, a decision to love, and then lives it faithfully. Not without challenges, but remembers. I'm not loving you as a warm, gushy feeling, the romantic stuff. I've decided to love you. I did it in Kelly Park when we were 17, and now at the age of 100, I still love one man and one man alone. I would tell you, too, uh, that she loves him very much. She's not in a great, great rush to join him. I asked her recently when she was looking at a picture of my dad, you miss him a lot? I miss him terrible. You love dad so much. I loved your father more than anyone in the world. Mom, do you love him and miss him enough that you want to be with him now? No, no, no. There'll be time for that later. And I think, in fact, she will, in heaven, have a great celebration with my dad. Something else, another couple of examples. Uh, I had a, a nephew who was born in what we'd call euphemistically a crisis pregnancy. And my dear sister needed to get back to work, and somebody had to take care of this baby. The moment he was born, because there was a need, my mom quit her job, and every day with my dad went to the house and took care of that child and raised that child and made him the extraordinary, wonderful young man that he is today. There were no questions asked. And you know, I'm now the age that my parents were when they gave up everything to say, our job now is to be there for that child, to help raise the children. And I couldn't do it now. I don't think I could. I don't think I have the energy, the patience to take on a child, an infant, and do that job. But they did without asking questions, because love does that. It just gives without counting the cost. Another short example. I remember years ago being at St. Patrick's Cathedral at a time when there was less security, so there were homeless people sleeping on the pews in the back and all around the church. And there was my mom when I, I thought she was off lighting a candle, but she was going from homeless person to homeless person, most of whom were asleep, and putting money in their hands or, or someplace near them. And I said, Mom, don't do that. They could wake up. You could startle them. They could have a knife or do something harmful to you. Oh, Jimmy, listen, I've been poor, and I know what it is to be poor, and I remember. And we've got to do whatever we can to help people and take the risks. These are people just like you and me. It was a great lesson for me, one that Pope Francis recently echoed when he said, it's not enough just to give to the homeless person, but to encounter them as a friend, as another human being just like us. I got that lesson from Cecilia a long, long time ago. Maybe one final story, I promise. Um, you know, whenever uh, my mom had surgeries for heart bypass and cancer and all the rest, as her son, but also as a priest, she would inevitably say, you know, clear out the room. I want to get ready for what I'm going to undergo and ask me to pray with her, to bless her, to give her the sacraments. And I have to tell you something. This is a great thing for any priest and certainly any son to say. Um, you know, I would listen to her in what she called a confession. And I'd have to say that uh, she was a million times holier and less sinful than me. And it's a wonderful thing when the person you're listening to in confession can teach you that, in fact, uh, our own sins are, uh, are far more significant than the penitence sinner sinning. A remarkable lady, good, kind, loving. Uh, if kindness matters, and I believe it does, she is the embodiment of that. So on this uh, celebration of her birthday, the 100th birthday of Cecilia McNeil Asante, uh, on behalf of, uh, of Joan and Patty, my wonderful sisters who have participated so wonderfully in caring for her, and Matthew and Jonathan and Marissa and Julia and Anthony, her grandchildren, and, uh, and the three great-grandchildren as well. We thank you, Mom, for being an embodiment of God's love made real. You are amazing. We love you so much, and we're so grateful to God that still you remain in our lives as a lesson in how to love and how to be rich in love. Thank you, Mom. As a people of faith, Let's profess our faith now in the words of our creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. 
I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now, with confidence in this God, this hound of heaven who never gives up on us, we present to him our petitions. The response is, Lord, hear our prayer. For those who lead the people of God, that they may seek after integrity and be true to their call to service, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, our, hear our, prayer. our prayer. That those who defend and promote abortion may be transformed by the renewal of their minds and always defend the right of every person to life, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who work, that they may see their labor as a way of becoming like God, the creator of all things, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those in our parish and family members who are ill may enjoy the consolation of the Lord and the presence of their loved ones, especially Christopher Tchaikovsky, Anne Marie Tine, Pat Guanguino, John Leota, Carol Variale, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, especially Thomas O'Shea the second, Mary Moran, Constance Polio, Eleanor Raimondo, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for the intention of this Mass, George Jelinek, Ed Bodor, and Raymond Hussey, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And let me add several intentions. First, for the sick, my friend Joyce Blancato, who successfully got through her surgery and is healing. Joyce, we keep praying for you. For Suzanne Scanio, my wonderful local teacher friend, who is uh, battling very bravely her cancer and is loved so much by all of us. Suzanne, please keep on keeping on. For Van Tutwiler, I want to pray. For, the, for Anthony Scotto, for Tracy Warshawski, for Victoria Sainez, Roderick Lewis, Sophia Maglione, Corinne La, I just saw Corinne yesterday, our retired parish outreach coordinator, uh, a brave and wonderful woman. Uh, Joan Donovan, my friend in Florida, and Howie Pomerantz. Uh, for Jim Harmon, pray for Nick Castellano, who's recovering from his motorcycle accident. For Marilyn Arbogast, and Tim Green, the wonderful football player who's fighting uh, ALS. Pray for Nancy Palumbo, for Judge Tony Falanga, great man. Jorge Clemente, Anthony Kremi, Melissa Bergman, I want to pray for Jack Carroll. I want to continue to pray for Stacy in her uh, current pregnancy and for that beautiful child within and the well-being of that child. For Jan Oaks, recovering from COVID. I want to pray for John Leota. I want to pray for Alyssa O'Brien and Anthony Ponte, who's fighting brain cancer. I want to pray, too, for all of those who are addicted in any way uh, for their recovery and their continued faithfulness to the program. Let me pray as well for uh, those who have died, especially uh, Marie Austin, wonderful and generous lady. For Thomas O'Shea, I want to pray for Marie Austin, Thomas O'Shea, Ann Brown, Raymond Hussey, I want to pray for Brian Hussey, I want to pray for Bill Kelly and Vita Palmieri, Joanne Tolson, Peter Larkin, for Joe and Richie Rella, for Father Tim Hurton, whose funeral we celebrated this week. I want to pray for Kieran Overbay, Kieran was only five years old, uh, born with genetic difficulty, and had five wonderful years of being loved by his family and has now gone home to God. For Matthew Torriello, I want to pray for Kathleen Smith and John Arturo and Captain Tim Murray, as well as for Aaron, his wife, and their five beautiful children. Let me pray for John Glauda, 
for Anthony Preziosi, my dear friend, for Connor and Will Robles and John Slade. Let me pray for Dave Robin and John Kappa, Michael Manzella for Kenny Bolando. This is the anniversary of Christina Formato's Return to God, a beautiful young lady, uh, and we, we miss her terribly, but we're grateful that she's in heaven. Cynthia Prague for Gaetano and Sal Angelo Emilo, for Pauline Romano and June and Ed Jandovitz, for Mary and Charlie Nobile and Billy Taylor, Robbie Purick, for Jimmy Soldo. I want to pray for Barry Champney and Norma Calabrese and Emily Lafaso, for Jerry Pangalo, for Joe and Marion Bacigalupo, for my dad, Nicholas Lasanti. I want to pray for my best friend, Father Joe Lukaszewski, Monica Kerrison, Peggy Barr, Dale Louise Oden, my friend from California who recently passed, Jerry and Edward Casal, for Ed Almer, for Judge Don Belfi, wonderful man, Tino Del Bello, De Bello, for Richard Jackal. I want to pray for Leon Sherman Jr. and Marie Sicolo, for John and Joan Donnelly, Vincent Castoria Jr., for Marilyn Salonia and Constance Polio, and always we remember as a great learning experience for all of us, the passing of George Floyd and all victims of unjust violence, that justice might reign in our society. For all of the people we love who pass from this life to the next, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And let's remember in happiness and anniversary to Frank and Linda Rosado, who are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. Many more years to you, Frank and Linda, and to your beautiful family. For all of those who are working to fight the pandemic, for those who are trying to find the vaccination we all need, for those who are on the front lines taking care of the patients who are sick, for our men and women in the armed forces who are always there for us around the world. Let me pray too for Connor Lasanti and Thomas Scanio and all those in the NYPD and, and police and firefighters everywhere, those who are on our front lines and our EMTs and our nurses and doctors. God bless us for having them. Uh, you may have heard recently of the case of uh, Rand Paul, the senator who was attacked in Washington. Uh, oddly enough, he was attacked by a group of people demonstrating uh, when he actually has stood with them in terms of their values, the insanity of our age. And thank God for the people who were there, like the police in the Capitol District, to protect him and his wife, lest they had been overwhelmed by the crowd. We really need these people who are on the front lines, and we thank God for them, and we ask him to watch over and protect them. In a, for a just society, for a fair society, for a loving society, for a society that respects all, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And let's take all these petitions and offer them to the Mother of God, ask her to bring them to her Son, as together we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed, Blessed be God, God forever. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer. Fruit of the vine, work of human hands, it will become for us our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and be pleased with the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. Lord, wash away my iniquity, cleanse me from all of my sin. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice will be found acceptable to God, our Heavenly Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands to the praise and the glory of his name for our good and the good of all his church. Lord, may this holy offering bring us your boundless blessing. May it accomplish within us its promise of salvation. And we ask you to grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, all-powerful and ever-living God, we praise and thank you through Jesus Christ our Lord for your presence and your action in our world. In the midst of conflict and division, 
We know it is you who turn our minds to thoughts of peace. Your spirit changes our hearts. Enemies begin to speak with one another. Those who were parted join hands in friendship. Nations, once at war, begin to seek the way of peace together. Your spirit is at work when understanding puts an end to strife, when hatred is quenched by mercy, when vengeance gives way to love and forgiveness. For this, we should never cease to thank and praise you. So we join now with all the choirs of heaven as they sing forever to your glory. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Father, from the beginning of time, you have always done what is good for us, so that we might be holy as you are holy. Look with kindness on your people gathered here today before you, and send forth the power of your Spirit, so that these gifts of bread and wine may become for us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have become your sons and your daughters. When we were lost and could not find our way to you, you loved us more than ever. Jesus, your son, innocent and without sin, gave himself into our hands and was nailed to a cross. And yet before he stretched out his arms between heaven and earth, in an everlasting sign of your loving covenant, he desired to celebrate the Paschal Feast in the company of his friends and disciples. And so, while they were at supper, Jesus took bread. He blessed the bread and broke it. He gave it to his friends and he said, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, Jesus took a chalice filled with the fruit of the vine. Again, Father, he thanked you for your goodness. He gave the chalice to his disciples and friends, and he said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. We do all of this in memory of Jesus Christ, who is our Passover and our lasting peace. We celebrate his death and his resurrection, and we look forward to the coming of the day when he will return to give us all the fullness of joy. Therefore, we offer you, God, ever faithful and true, this sacrifice which restores us to your friendship. Father, look with love on those who have called to share in the one sacrifice of Christ. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, make us all into one body and heal us of every division. Keep us always in communion of mind and heart with Francis, our Pope, with John, our Bishop, along with all the bishops, the clergy, the religious, and all of God's people. Help us to work together for the coming of your kingdom until at last we stand in your presence to share in the lives of the saints in the company of Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, in the company of St. Joseph, her devoted spouse, and all the saints, and in the company, too, of all of our dearly departed, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, all the people we have loved and lost, let's pause to remember them now and commend them to God's tender mercy. And then, freed from every shadow of death, we shall take our place in the new creation, and we shall give you thanks with and through Jesus Christ, who is our risen and our loving Lord. For it is through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, that all glory, all honor is yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I hope that if you love someone deeply, you'll never be ashamed of that love, 
but proclaim to the whole world that you've been blessed in finding someone to love deeply. That should be our relationship with our God, that you and I might have the courage and the passion to say, I belong to Jesus Christ, no apologies, no excuses, I'm his. For that grace in your life and mine, that courage, let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. Protect us from all anxiety, as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you my peace, my peace I give to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. With your spirit. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Lord Jesus Christ, with faith in your love and mercy, we eat your body and drink your blood. Let it not bring us condemnation, but health in mind and in body. My friends, behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ bring us all to share in everlasting life. If you're watching this program, you're probably unable to physically receive the Eucharist, but we can be bonded with him spiritually. On the screen, you'll have the prayer that we'll pray together now, an act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things. And I desire to receive you into my soul since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart, I embrace you as if you were already there, and I unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. While I'm uh, purifying the chalice, just a couple of announcements. One would be a word of thanks. Uh, to all the people who allowed us to have great sacramental celebrations this week. We had to delay the May 1st communions to August, and we had two wonderful ceremonies, uh, two masses with Father Kevin and myself, and beautiful children in the second grade who received communion for the first time. It was beautiful to see the joy in their faces as they came up to receive, and that of their parents and families as well. And then on Wednesday, we had a visit from Bishop Andrzej, our vicar, who came and celebrated confirmation, a wonderful celebration as well, again delayed from the... Uh, early spring till now because of the pandemic, but a great week for our parish to celebrate First Communions and Confirmations, and uh, thanks to all who helped her prepare them, especially Donna Kesselman and the Religious Ed staff and Elizabeth Woods for the beautiful gift of music and so many others who made it possible. And to you parents who got these kids ready for First Communion and Confirmation and to their teachers and catechists, uh, very, very grateful. A couple of other things just by way of uh, announcements. Um, let's stay in touch. One of the ways to do that is by going to our parish website, www.ollmp.org. Um, that's right, right? mp.org, and you'll have uh, not only the Mass, obviously, but uh, we also uh, have on there the weekly radio show that I do, on Personally Speaking, and we also uh, have some older shows with some pretty interesting guests. Uh, also, you might think of going to YouTube and uh, go to Mon uh, Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti, and uh, 
had some great guests this past week, a firefighter who had lost his faith and uh, came back to believe, uh, became a real believer. Uh, another guy, um, Thomas Roberts, who's put out this beautiful video you should all see called uh, The Great Realization, what we're supposed to learn from the pandemic. What do we learn from this terrible experience of, of COVID? The Great Realization on YouTube. But we talk about these things and about faith with so many people, so tune in to Personally Speaking as well. I think that's the only announcement we have. Anything else? The announcements today come. Watch One Holy Hour with me. The Nocturnal Adoration Society will resume its prayer service. All night, adoration begins on Friday, September 4th, at 10 p.m. in the church, continuing through the night, ending at 6.30 a.m. Saturday morning. Masks and social distancing are required. All are welcome to attend. Thank you and have a blessed day. Thank you, Lorraine. And some folks said to me recently, well, since you're not uh, uh, asking at the Mass anymore for funds, I guess we're doing okay. We're not. So please continue to send in your envelopes. And for our friends around the country, we love your support and we appreciate it very deeply. Let's pray. Lord God, you renew us at your table with this, the bread of life. May this food strengthen us in the ways of love. May it help us to serve you by serving one another. And we ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you and your families in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Mass is ended. Let us go in peace. Thanks be to God.